So Lou Jane's here, right? Okay. So it's a demo session. So, but we're gonna have a lot of people come in and out because I'm I'm live. So <laughs> you're from Brazil. Um, because they're known for the channel is really known for SAT and ACT. So we're trying it out today for the GMAT. So, so there's going to be some, some traffic, some confusion, but I just want to maintain it. Okay. As, as much as possible and as clear as possible. All right. So this is how we're going to conduct class. And I really want to announce it from the beginning that this is a demo session for GMAT. There'll be future sessions, you know, planned depending, uh, GMAT is, it's for business school entrance exam. Um, what I want to cover today are the number one kind of skill that you need to develop to do well on GMAT, on the English section of the GMAT. And math, uh, we are trying to find a substitute, a replacement teacher. So as soon as we find a replacement instructor, we'll make sure that we add on to. So I only invited a small group of uh, people who have uh, set deadline for GMAT as well as it will be applying to a business school soon. And it will be posted on YouTube and it will be saved into Twitch as well to see the initial response of this class and then maybe decide to expand on it and go like all in. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan and I go by Ryan Choice. Uh, where can you see what days will be? Oh, I'm going to be posting a calendar with the schedule from now on. So we know exactly when we're going to cover GMAT, GRE, LSAT, you know, SAT and so forth. So as soon as we have the calendar open, um, check those out and then we'll make it very, uh, you know, very clean and, and then easy to understand. Okay, Brazil. Thank you. Muito obrigado. So those of you who are tuning in for GMAT, let me cover this really fast because we only have like 55 minutes to go. Um, so again, my name is Ryan Choice. I, I went to Columbia Business School as well as I did an extensive study at Haw School Business at Berkeley. Uh, I did take GMAT five times total, um, acing the test three times, and I believe I missed maybe one or two on the other two. Now, the, the first one was for myself to get into a business school for the rest of them or for practices because this is my profession. I teach for a living. Uh, secondly, I don't know if Lujane told you guys, but I am also a, a cognitive researcher at Columbia University still. So I'm still as a student finishing off um, the degree and then I'm teaching on a side and I have an academy as well in Southern California. So that's what I do. I've been um, teaching GMAT mostly one-on-one with private clients around the world for the past 12 years or so. Uh, I've never done a group session with GMAT, so that's why I'm calling it a demo session because I just want to make sure that, you know, I can handle a group. This is a very intricate test. Uh, please don't take it lightly. It is actually quite difficult um, to go through, but if you develop the skills that I'm about to go through, I think you'll do a thousand times better. So this is a, from the book, the official guide. Um, unfortunately, I cannot send it to you. You need to get a copy yourself. Uh, it's going to be a GMAT official guide. It can be 2020, 2021, 2019. They're all the same. Uh, pages usually don't change either. They don't really revise anything for like five, six, seven years. Uh, you don't need the book though. Hey, hey, what's up? <laughs> you don't need the book though because I'll be sort of projecting everything today. But if you really want to practice and get good at it, you need to get a copy yourself. You can go to mba.com and get a free practice or you can get a digital version of this and so you can practice online since it's a computer based anyways or you can go and then buy from amazon and so forth as well so it's up to you but you need to get a copy of this um, we use it we use copies as a fair use only we don't really distribute you know you know copyrighted materials so unfortunately we cannot really give you these stuff um, Okay, so please take note. I'm, I'm just going to try to make it really short and good. So those of you are tuning in and you're confused because why is he talking about GMAT when he's supposed to talk about SAT and ACT? It's because we are covering GMAT today. Now, there is a very important skill that I always teach to all my students, including law school bound, medical school bound, business, college, and so forth. 
and that skill is called the core versus the non-core and then that gives what we call the keywords extraction and we're going to cover one last thing is called connotation so these three skills if you master them well i think you can do the verbal section and the critical reading section no problem i think it's going to be uh, really smooth and then for grammar there are only about six rules that you need to master which is a lot easier compared to like something like SAT which requires like 15 different rules and so forth so the concept of core versus non-core is that you have to differentiate ideas from details so when you're reading something we're going to go over a couple passages together you need to be able to separate the two so lift the ideas from the details and then not ignore details but in details are not going to be tested as much so we call this the idea of 80 20 um, and if you have like business background and so forth it's called the pareto principle and that's called the high efficiency paradigm meaning you have to learn to read 20 percent to solve 80 percent of all questions so this is pretty much what I teach for all classes regardless of which test you're taking we start from here and how do you do it is you extract keywords from this and then you solve and if you get really good at this though you can actually go 10% reading to 90% solving uh, it, it's going to be like a little bit weird and different when you first get exposed to it. Everyone's asking what's GMAT. I think there should be someone. What can I, <laughs> where can I see what they, yeah. Well, uh, boo. Okay. So let me go back to the passage. So watch this. So this is the typical one. And this is saying go to line 10 to 15. So 10 to 15 is bolder right there. And it says, because large advertising expenditures represent a significant investment on the part of the manufacturers, only companies that expect to recoup these costs in the long run through consumers, repeat process, uh, purchases of the products can afford to spend such amount. If you look at the answers, uh, my point is this, right? You have to be able to uh, extract keywords. Now, when I say keywords, it meaning where is this statement coming from? This statement is given by uh, Mark Quartz and McCann. Uh, Mc, McGann, McGann, okay? So if you come here, look at C. So you see the names, so you eliminate A and B, right? That's what I mean by extraction and keywords. And so when you got to be able to comfortably do that if you really want to reach top scores. Um, this is called context, meaning these, these are called the core, right? So we are talking about these two individuals doing a research. So I go with uh, McQuartz, McQuartz and McGann. So I got those two names written down. I have five options and two are gone. So I go back and then try to understand where this came from again. It says they found that. So they found that, discovered, right, discovered that so you go back again am i making an, an exception to the generalization am i explaining a research or am i explaining watch this it said because and what because means it's explanation right so now you're down to two see that process of elimination has to happen because of keywords now the bolded version started with because. Because means it's an explanation. So I got two keywords now and I need, by the way, if you have three keywords, you're always gonna get the answer. So you're, it's like a puzzle game where you're looking for the right piece A, right piece B, and right piece C. And if you get those three pieces, the door unlocks, kind of like that, right? So you're kind of playing that game. So let's pretend that these are gone now, right? So let me wipe that out, okay? So they're gone, right? Because they don't have the keywords. What are the keywords again? One, two, three. Oof. And then you go with one, two. Okay. So you have two options now to explain why 
research was conducted or to offer an observation reported by so-and-so. Now, if you look back again, if you only read the bolded out area, there is no explanation as to why they conducted the research. There is no genesis point, meaning there is no beginning point, no origin point. All it's doing, we found that something, A, we found that A, say equals B. And that is not to give a reason, right? It is an observation. You see that? Found that goes with observation. So now I'm going to click that with the third keyword and then done. Now, this is kind of the essence of everything reading for GMAT. As long as you perfect that skill that I just demonstrated of finding three keywords, you'll be able to get all of them. And, and, and I'm going to demonstrate, we can go through, say, a thousand different reading questions from random GMAT tests from the previous years, and we'll still be able to do what we just did right there with this. And so that is kind of the general idea of where we're going to go maybe today and tomorrow. It's a two-day session for now, and then we're going to think whether a third day is necessary. If not, a full-blown and comprehensive stuff. Now, I had an option, obviously, to announce it on social media, such as Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and so forth. I didn't because I needed to understand how this was going to unfold. So I would really appreciate uh, if you have any questions. Is the mainly for critical reading for all verbal, all verbal. Now, uh, all verbal meaning all reading in this case, because grammar is has nothing to do with keywords. Grammar has nothing to do with keywords. Grammar has everything to do with six rules which I'm going to briefly go over today and then comprehensively go over tomorrow. So as long as you know those six rules, you'll be able to go through all grammar as well. Uh, for all things reading, though, yes, all things reading. So in, in, what I'm saying is all things verbal, yes, because so it wouldn't work with sentence correction. No, it wouldn't work for sentence correction because those are fundamentally embedded in, in just knowing the rules and kind of matching and crossing stuff out and so forth, which I'll demonstrate. Um, this has everything to do with the, you know, the reading comprehension side of it with the passages on. Um, let's continue. Let's do a couple more. Uh, it is asking, what is the primary purpose of the passage? So where do you find the primary purpose of the passage is the main question, right? So you really have to think it through because uh, a lot of times uh, the last sentence of the passage the entire passage is what we call the main idea, right? So I always recommend that if you're going to solve something like this, please go and start with the last sentence. So right there. Right? This is where the main idea usually are hidden. Uh, this is true to pretty much everything um, and, and all tests as well. So we're going to go here. Uh, let's go and zoom into it. Because consumers recognize color advertisements as more expensive than black and white. The point at which repetition of an advertisement is perceived as excessive comes sooner for color than black and white. So I need to highlight three keywords. Now, if, you, if you're thinking like, what are the keywords? Like it's, the keywords are the words that's gonna summarize the zone. The zone is, this is the zone, right? And how do you know the zone? Because they told us, go to the main idea. The main idea is the last sentence of everything. So I'm looking at that, and now I need to pick up three keywords from it. So I'm going to go consumer, right? Because the consumer is doing the action. Consumers what? Consumers recognition or perception, which is the same thing. So I got A, and then I got B. And then you ask consumers perception or recognition of what? You go color advertisement, right? Color advertisement. Cool. Okay. So now I'm looking at the answers. So the first thing I'm going to look for is what? Consumer. And then you go like, how do you know it's consumer? Because consumer is driving the action. So I don't see consumer there. And then I'm looking at the no consumer there. I got consumer here. And then I don't have consumer there. See, three out of five out. Watch. 
And I know there's going to be like, you know, when you first approach GMAT and then, you know, because you are mostly young professionals in your 20s and maybe 30s and so forth, you're going to look at this and go like, no way, like no way, no way works like that. Come on. Like it can't be right. This is about reading, understanding, analysis, reading, comprehension, critical thinking. Uh, my, uh, my refutal to that would be no. It's not about reading comprehension as they make out to be. It's actually about keyword matching puzzle system work. And that's what standardization is and what standardized test is. And that's why so many people are so critical about these tests is because you really don't need critical understanding or thinking to get it right. You only need to know how to play the puzzle. So since it is talking about consumer, I'm going to go consumer, right? So you shouldn't zoom this one, by the way, to look. So A doesn't have consumer, B doesn't have consumer, and e, uh, D doesn't have consumer. So I'm left with two now. And then we set recognize, perceived. Yeah, recognize, perceived. So recognition and perception, perception. Response is not recognition. So it kind of sounds similar, but it has nothing to do with it. So I got two, right, one. And then if you want to put in advertising, it's going to be a repeat. So I'm done. It's two versus one. Look, I'm going in order of the first test on the book. I'm not chair picking anything. I'm just utilizing the same thing over and over again. You master that one skill. Your life is going to be a lot better, a lot easier for all tests, including GRE. Um, I think I've, you know, I work with a lot of law school bound people. So what they'll set as well. And I mentioned this about medical school too. There's a car section in the MCAT, so it's the same thing. It's just, and even for high schoolers tuning in accidentally now, uh, the AP Lang is the same thing too. So about this skill or this skill of what we call core versus non-core keyword matching system, what work for like 11 different tests that we consider of very, very, very high importance. What's the trick in getting the correct keywords? The trick is this. That's a great question, Eugene. All right, so the trick is this. If they give you a zone, and the zone can be any line, right? So it can be, say, 10 to 15, or it can be 2 to 4, it can be 60 to 72. These are all called zones, right? The trick when it comes to finding the keyword is asking yourself, how can I, how can I summarize this zone using three keywords right so this point is the one that i always talk about I, I know i should come up with like more unique or or a different example but i always use romeo loves juliet right romeo loves juliet so if someone asks you about the entire book right they throw you the william shakespeare's romeo and juliet and they go like hey what is the book about then you go oh it's about romeo keyword number one loves Juliet, or you can vice versa, Juliet loves Romeo. But if I go to say chapter two, say page 46 to 52, right? Then the keywords could change instead of Romeo loving Juliet, it could be Romeo's dad hating, right? Juliet's mom, right? Could happen. So depending on where you are, you're just trying to create a summary version of it. So one of the neat tricks that you can actually use is what we call repetition, right? Increases the importance, right? Hence the likelihood of it being a keyword. So whenever you see a word repeat, like over and over again, let me show you this one right there, right? So one of the things that keeps repeating here, you can see, uh, we see uh, advertisement, right? And then you go companies, consumers, um, and then you just keep looking for anything that repeats over and over again, right? Now, if this zone is not good enough for you to pick up on the keywords, then you can expand within the paragraph like this, and you can see that consumer, right? And then we go consumer see that repetition of two already increases exponentially compared to say any word any other word that is say investment right with if investment is not repeated then the ones that are repeated actually goes up 
But it's a trick that you use, but the best way to do it is to always think about Romeo and Juliet's case and kind of go like, hey, uh, if I'm in the zone 10 to 15, what three words can I use to explain it to someone who has not read the, the piece? I also have a kind of a informal name to it. It's called uh, teaching a dumb friend, right? So uh, it, it's kind of bad to say that, but if you have a friend who doesn't like to study or read or anything, right? And then, um, and then comes to you and says, hey, you know what? I didn't read the piece. Like, can you tell me on the way to school or on the way to work or whatever, right? They ask you, hey, what was it about? Then you would have to summarize the whole piece, right? Using a couple words, right? Oh yeah, it's about company X buying company B, right? So now you've already done it. You extracted keywords and you actually summarize the whole piece. So what you see right there is again, is a repetition of what I did with number one. Number two, same exact motion happens. So let's see if we can do number three. It says, uh, Kermani's research as described suggests that which are the following about consumers' expectation about the quality of the advertised products. So we'll go back again to the conclusion because this is where they were talking about consumers' expectation or perception. Right? Let's read this one more time. It says, uh, it's about color, consumer, advertisement, expensive, money sign. Right, so you got consumer, color, advertisement, expensive, right? Color versus black and white, and so forth. Now, watch this. I'm going to do something kind of crazy here, okay? So I'm going to go with color. So I got color there, right? So I got color color okay so you so you got to be really good at catching the colors right so i'm gonna take out right i'm gonna take out c and e because no color i gotta mention the color right and then now i have to attach uh repetition repetition so which one says repetition this one doesn't talk about repetition this one talks about repetition this one does talk about repetition. Now A is gone, see? One at a time, I'm just getting rid of it. So now I have left with two, right? B and D. So you gotta be able to chop it down five answers to like two or three like that. So you gotta find one keyword, two keywords, and now I gotta find the third keyword now, right? So I'm left with B and D. Now it says expectation can be shaped by the presence of color as well as frequency of advertisement. And this one says, those expectations are, un, are likely to be higher for products whose black and white advertisement has been repeated for those who are color as repeated. Now, this is actually the one that requires some logic because if you go back, it says, the consumers recognize color advertisement more expensive than black. The repetition makes the excessive of color drop faster than that of black. That's all it's saying, right? So this is the one that actually requires some logical understanding. It says the color is recognition higher, so excessiveness will bring down color faster than the black and white. That's all it's saying, you know, that's all it's saying. So if I have those two, those Expectations can be shaped by the presence of color advertisement as well as the frequency, which is true, which is true. But this is the problematic one. Those expectations are likely to be higher for products. Now, um, I'm actually saying the opposite, right? Because I'm saying that with the repeated the advertisements are less often. This is two things. One, it's opposite of what I said. And then also it's an assumption two things as an assumption of something that was not stated here. So if you bring something new to it, uh, then it's going to be counted as wrong as well. Okay. So two things again, if you read that last sentence one more time, you're going to see, well, that's not exactly what the author was saying. It could be different or opposite and followed by it's an assumption that we cannot make. Okay. 
Now I'm going to give you another crazy version. It says, watch this. We're on the same thing. It says third study. And how do you I know we're on the same thing? It says uh, on the third study. So we're still in this range for three consecutive questions. So you, again, you have to know where to go. And then watch this. Are you ready? I'm going to do one done. What happened there? What happened there? What happened there is that none of them, if you look at B, if you look at C, right? They don't have the combination of these repetition, color advertisement, consumer. If you look at everything else, they don't have that combination, right? Like which one has the combination of those three? We can look into it. Repetition, right? Color advertisement, consumer. We go consumers, color, no repetition, right? It will attract more attention to the readers. Uh, repetition, no consumer, no color. It may be perceived to consumers, color, no repetition. It is likely to be perceived by consumers, color, no repetition. Hello, hi. I hope that makes sense because it's like going with say five keywords and let's assume, and this has four, two, three, one, right? The one that has higher, so you've been doing everything kind of in the wrong way because you think um, I got to understand and make a logical assessment of the passage to solve. In reality, all these tests, including this test GMAT, right? In reality, all the tests that I've seen except uh, maybe for a bar exam, right? Or even that, bar exam is still similar. Um, or except maybe CPA exam, right? Which is for accounting. Um, or maybe just to become a doctor except the car section. Everything is the same. You've been playing the game with the wrong strategies. Your strategy is I'm going to I'm going to rely on my brain so I can understand and I can solve it. in reality should be I'm going to catch the keyword so I can match it with the my answers and whichever one has the most will win. It's a completely different game. It's just completely different mentality and mindset. Now if you, again, feel uncomfortable doing that because you feel that you need to learn something right through these sessions, that you really need to master the, the comprehension side of it, I have two news for you. One, if you really want to improve critical reading and critical understanding of reading of anything, it will take you five to ten years to master that. It's not going to take you five days, five weeks, five months. It's going to be five to ten years of nonstop reading. That's the only way. Okay. It's the only way. It's, and no, one, no one improves critical thinking and understanding in five weeks or even five months. It's going to take you five years plus. And secondly, uh, the fact that you believe that you actually can't understand what the author is saying in such a limited time is foolish. Because if you sit there and think like, well, I'm smart. You know, I went to a good school. I got good DNA, good genes from my parents. Right? I can do this. I got a good, good company. Right? You know, and then they tell me I'm smart and so forth. And then you tackle this and you go like, I can do this. Look, even the professors of English departments of Ivy Leagues, if they were presented with this passage and these questions and asked them to solve within, say, 50 minutes or so, their comprehension of the passage could be around, say, 70 to 80 percent, let's say. Okay. For people who are preparing for these tests, young adults, maybe maybe teenagers for SAT, the comprehension can be 20 to say 60%. So for you to rely on 70, 80% to solve, uh, it's dangerous. 20 to 60%, that's just chaotic, right? So instead, what you should do is rely on keywords, which could increase the chances to 90 to 100% accuracy. It's, it's a different game. You got to think it differently starting now. Hopefully you, you listen and then you do it. But if you don't, <laughs> what can I do? What can I say? You know? Okay. One last thing from the same thing. It says 
consumer perception relationship between the frequency and the products and so forth. Now, it says Kermani would agree. Now, agree means it's an idea. Now, there is, it comes a little bit of complicated thing. Here it says suggest. And then here it says suggest. The word suggest, right, means I'm going to go with detail. The word agree means I'm going to go with idea. Okay. Suggestion meaning I have to count on the details of the experiments to make an inference, meaning make an assumption. Agree meaning, hey, would you agree? Do you agree with my idea? So if you go here, right, watch this. If you go here, it says, in addition, third study. So this is what we call a non-core, meaning I am in the experiment itself. So the idea had to come before. So think of it this way. This is idea, and this is detail to back up the idea. So in the land of reading, it's always positioned where you go idea, detail, right? Idea, detail, meaning state what you want to say back it up state what you want to say back it up right so this is how the passages are formulated i'm asking hey kermani would most likely agree so i gotta go here instead so you, knowing where to go it's essential for these tests too two studies by kermani have found that consumers perceive expensive advertisement of high brand Right? It says consumers initially perceived expensive advertisement equals high brand. At some level, spending of manufacturers, so you got manufacturers advertising, and then it's going to be manufacturer. See, that repeats again, of product quality. So if I ask you to give me right keywords, it should be, check this out, it should be consumer manufacturer right you got the money sign and quality there you go four keywords right there right so when you say money money equals the advertisement right so the money that you actually put in to the advertisement these are called bits right or fragments right that i'm using so consumer uh, money sign advertisement quality equals quality and then manufacturer and then you look at the answer choices. Oof, I don't know if I can do this. Let me go one at a time. Consumer, advertising, evaluating, product quality. Now, a couple of things that I'm missing there, as you can see, I'm missing the manufacturer as well as the money side. So consumer, advertisement, and then quality. Same thing, three, three keywords. Consumer advertisement quality same thing three i go advertisement consumer quality manufacturer four consumer advertisement uh, quality three you see that wins done uh, I, I demonstrated this, except maybe this one, which required a little bit of more uh, logic, but I would say that those are very rare. Um, we solved one, two, right? One, two, three, four, five, and four out of five were directly dependent on the keyword system. And if you actually end up solving, say, 100, I would say 90 to 95 of the 100 will be dependent on the keyword system and only 5 to 10 will be dependent on any type of logic insertion at all. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay. So that's number one. And I'm going to, everything else is kind of, so I want you to practice. If you have one of these books, you can practice with what we just said. Uh, and then just start plugging in the keywords and see, you know, how many you get right. Maybe solve 20, you know, today and tomorrow. And then maybe we can continue on that session tomorrow. 
And then um, I want to talk about grammar a little bit because reading wise, all these things are kind of the same with the keyword insertions and core and non core. Where am I going? I need, yeah, I need grammar. Okay. So here we are grammar. Let's do a little bit of grammar. I'm going to explain some stuff about grammar so you guys can understand like this one. So overall, there are five, six, six things that you need to learn. I said six, right? So it's the modifier, which equals what to do with details. Parallelism. Uh, three is verb tense. Four, uh, faulty comparison. Five is subject verb agreement. And then the last one are idioms. Now, mind you, that idioms is going to be extremely hard because you have to do a lot of memorization for that. Uh, but these five which will account to say 90% are extremely easy to master. And then it actually can be done within days, within a couple days, you can definitely do those. No problem. Okay. So today I'm going to cover a couple stuff and give you samples as to how they, how, how they work. What's number four, a faulty comparison. Okay, my handwriting is getting worse. Faulty comparison. And Lujan, I really don't know what, when I'm going to go like publicly about the GMAT, like I could announce um, it today or tomorrow. So I don't know yet. So just, just kind of for your information, it could grow uh, a lot, um, but, or it could maintain at, at the current, you know, the people that we are demoing with. So take advantage of this small type of class and ask many questions, as many questions as you can possibly can. And Lujane and Lujane's friend, you should just keep asking idioms. Because when there are many people, you, we can't really have those intimate sort of Q and A anymore. But this one is making sense, Lujane, right? It's about the whole reading keyword thing. You can practice it at home with your test books and apply it and then just keep the logic out of it and just keep pumping and see how many you can get right and so forth. Anyways, when it comes to mod, um, I'm going to detail lecture on mod today. So mod equals detail. It's actually hard, you know, at the beginning to learn this is actually hard. There are four different types of mods, right? Uh, and, and so the first one, mod one, mod two, three, four, the first one is actually called intro mod, intro. The second one is called a positive, but we, I just call it descriptive mod. Number three is called participial mod. And then the fourth is called prep positional mod. Ooh, got bad. Okay. Oh, you need to know this because a bunch of questions are going to come from this no matter what. So intro mod is when you have a mod comma SVO. SVO stands for subject, right? Verb object. Also, you need to know is that SVO equals ID, which is independent clause. Now, grammar is one of those things that I feel super confident because um, nine out of 10 private clients that, that we work with GMAT 101 uh, miss uh, on average one and the entire grammar section of the GMAT. So one, you know, not two, not three, just one average, meaning zero, one, right? Zero, one, zero, one, maybe two sometimes, but mostly one. Now, why is this possible? Because if you say something like, let me show you this. It says, 
Uh, like the grassy field and old pastures that upland sandpipers need to feeding for feeding and nesting when it returns in May after wintering in the Argentine Pampas. You see that all of that is called mod one introductory. I'm introduced. This is the entire thing is a detail. So I'm introducing whatever comes after. That's my subject, right? But the problem with that is sandpipers do not travel, right? They don't travel, right? So what what does travel? United States does not travel, you know. Um, so you kind of have to go like, what what am I trying to see? So look at the answer choices. See, the only thing you gotta look at is the first look. Boom, 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 boom. And we already agreed that these are not, so I only have two options now. It's called a dangling modifier, a misplaced modifier for a technical name. It's just, I got a mod introducing my subject and it's the wrong subject. And that is one of the most common grammar mistakes on GMAT. It's, it's called dangling mod, right? So I only have two options, right? Those two, and then I'm gonna zoom in and then it says the bird itself is vanishing and then it says that the problem with that is that whenever you say that or comma which it triggers another mod okay so you got a mod comma that mod so i got two mods so it's like detail comma detail period or i got mod comma in this case, SVO, right? So you can't do that. Uh, this, by the way, I don't know when, you know, this particular dangling mod and so forth, it's usually taught in, in US, um, I would say during high school, but um, in overseas country and so forth, I've seen uh, as early as middle school in some of the Asian countries, and some of the Middle Eastern countries as well, uh, when they practice at an international school and so forth. Now, this is re, it's taught again and re-emphasized during the first year of college, right? In, in, in a class called English 101 in America. So we do that. It, it's, it's not as easy as you think. The, the whole mod idea, right? It's, it's quite complicated, but if you can get it, all right? Um, let's go back and see, okay. So mod one, it's an intro mod that describes the subject that is right after the comma. So memorize it that way. Mod two, comma, mod two, comma, VO means this is a, hmm, gotta be, okay. This is an intro and this is a description. So it's going backwards, right? And they're called the mod two, or it could also happen as SVO comma mod two, then this would modify whatever comes before the comma. They're called a positive, right? But you gotta understand that. Now mod three, okay, we call them participials. And these are the mods that have the word ing, en, or ed at the beginning of the mod. Okay, so example of that would be having lost a bird, comma, svo. You can see right there that ing, right, triggers the mod three. Now, like I said, these things require many practices and understanding, but I'm just doing a general kind of coverage of, a, of grammar. And what it does is it creates a, what we call a condition, right? That affects the entire sentence, okay? So one more time, participial are mods that contain the words that end with ing, en, ed, 
right? That if you have those things, one, two, or three, it creates a condition by which it affects the entire sentence, not just one word. So in theory, you could put mod three SVO, oof, SVO, S comma mod three comma VO, or SVO comma mod three, right? The location of the mod would not matter, right? It's the same. Why? Because it affects the entire SVO. Now, I do get a lot of, uh, of clients coming in thinking, ah, man, grammar is easy, you know? Like, you know, I heard that the grammar is from high school, from middle school. So they treat it like really lightly and they always go like, ah, oh, it's a piece of cake. I'll just read it, you know, make some sense out of it. I'll just go any money, any mo. I'll pick it. That is the absolute nonsense I've ever heard because grammar is easy in that there are only six rules you need to master in that. So the coverage wise is easy, uh, but grammar is hard because as you can see, I didn't even go through mod four yet. There's so many intricate things that you need to master for you to know the, the whole six. The good news is it takes days if you fully commit to grammar to perfect it. It does not need weeks or months. Now, weeks and months are more for reading, right? But grammar, if you commit your time and effort to it, you can really definitely master within say five to 10 days. Uh, I have had clients and students and even in high school perfect grammar within 10 days. Uh, but it's very rare because not many people have the time or dedication or they don't even care about it as much. But let's go over mod, mod 4 really fast before ending today. Mod 4 is prepositional. Prepositions are like of, to, from, by. So whenever you have these, like say two, and you have a mod after that, this combination is called prepositional mod or prepositional phrase. So there you go. Those are the four. Now, why do you need them? <laughs> uh, to answer something like this with ease. Now, if you knew all the things that I just said, right, of the mods one through four, you'd be able to solve this in about 10 seconds. If not, you're going to have to read, you're going to have to read, you're going to have to read every single time and it will take you two to four minutes. Okay, 10 seconds, guys, versus two to four minutes. Like, you gotta choose which path you wanna go. Look, whoever ends up watching this live or recorded, I really want you to know getting a top 1%, which is 99 percentile, or perfect on GMAT or any test, including, you know, SAT, ACT, and GMAT and GRE, is not as difficult as you think. You know, it's a very systematic movement, it's a very strategy driven, hack driven method. Um, I, I hear a lot of nonsense of like, um, oh, you have to know this much of math or you have to know this much of this, this much of biology for like tests like ACT. That's nonsense. You don't need any of that. I already gave you the number one skill that you need for reading, which is the keyword driven core versus non-core. I'm telling you, we need only six rules of grammar and I cover just one. That's it, you know, and then what else is there? Well, there's math, but in terms of English, that's pretty much it. Uh, I also mentioned, though, the difficulty of covering this idiom. Now, idiom, um, let's, let's put it this way. Idiom, um, it's a combination of words that people just say that can be grammatically wrong but acceptable in different countries based on their culture and history. So, you know, when I went, when I was in London, people would come to me and say, uh, I'll knock you up tomorrow, or I'll knock you up tomorrow in America, meaning I'm going to punch you in the face. But in, in, in UK, in London, I'll knock you up tomorrow means I'm going to come by and visit you so we can hang out tomorrow. Or it could be something like a bloody this, bloody that. In US, if you said bloody this, bloody that, it means violence. It means, you know, graphic stuff. In UK, it just, it's just the same. Bloody this, everyone says that. Bloody this, bloody that, right? So idioms, there are hundreds, if not 
thousands of idioms that you need to memorize for the US standardized test. If you have, say, three to four months to prep for it, I have a long list of idioms that I can give you that you should memorize for the test. However, this should be the last thing you do. You should focus on this five because idioms, it may be two to four at best questions will have to do with idioms. And everything else is going to be mod, parallel, verb, tense, faulty comparison, and SVA. So I'm going to cut it right here. And I'll take some questions, but tomorrow I'll cover the rest of the, um, the grammar. And then I'll go into more uh, in detail in terms of reading on how to dissect some of these things. And maybe we'll cover 10 to 15 reading questions and so forth. But again, uh, thanks for uh, visiting. Uh, this is a demo session for GMAT. Um, I'm most likely going to go uh, you know, public in general so more people can just join and then freely practice GMAT. But I really want to make sure that those of you tuning in right now live, uh, Lejeune and your friends, be able to conquer this and get 99 percentile, which I strongly believe that all of you can if you have the dedication. And if you follow the procedures that I'm putting forward, instead of questioning it, questioning it all the time and doubting it. I think you should just go for it. I did say from the beginning or at the beginning of it, I already took five official tests and then I've proven or I've, I've tested all these things that I'm teaching you out on the real setting. So I know they work uh, and I, you should try it. And I know many of you have high goals, you know, top business schools around the world. Uh, I wait, you know, I work with 20, 25 uh, VIP clients every year to help them ingress to those institutions. And GMAT is a integral component of it. Some business schools, because of COVID, are not requiring GMAT, or they maybe are taking GRE instead of GMAT, but top institutions like the Sloan or maybe Harvard Business School, uh, Wharton, they still require GMAT, uh, and that not counts about 20 to 30% of the applications. So. Please do well, you know, and tomorrow will be maybe the second or last day. And depending on how we do, we'll, we'll think of what steps to take after that. Um, I'm mostly spending a lot of time this week is uh, ACT week. So for high school students, Saturday, there's an official sitting for as ACT. So I'll be most likely spending a lot of time doing ACT. So that's why we're doing just a two day for now. Uh, but after that, if you do get feedback, if you can give me feedback, um, you, you know, whoever's tuning in live as to you know, what you need, what you want to get done and so forth, then we might come up with a better plan. Now, it, it's a lot of people, not a lot of people, but because they're in school now, but people are coming in and out and, and I, I want to put, I'm going to put a calendar with the schedule on it on Twitch. And this is one of the reasons why I chose Twitch is because we, we get to do that. And then so people can just look at the calendar and just drop by and drop in. If you don't have any questions, that's it for me. Um, I got other classes that I have to run, but it was a pleasure. I know Lujain, but I don't know the rest of you. But one day, hopefully we can hang out <laughs> via Zoom or something. No problem, Lujain. Uh, yeah, do your thing for next week and then I'll catch up with you next week. Uh, and to your friends, thank you so much for tuning in. And tomorrow, hopefully, we're going to have another sort of enlightening moment and a great kind of prep process. No problem. Thank you, guys. 